Hello and welcome to Listen Up, an academic and educational podcast brought to you by Cedar Schools and College that bring together voices, um, well, experts from the world of education and voices from the wider community. In today's episode, uh, I'm proud to welcome an intellectual giant whose list of academic achievements and accolades is quite astronomical. Uh, astronomical. A prominent figure in the field of quantum physics, uh, holder of uh, the Emma Daud Chair, currently the Dean at uh, LUMS Sayyid Babar Ali School of Science and Engineering, Director of the upcoming National Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, has uh, published over 80 research articles in international journals, including the Physical Review Series, Optics Express, Journal of the American Chemical Society, and uh, is also the General Secretary of the Khwarizmi Science Society, which is focused on the popularization of science at the grassroots level. Welcome to Cedar College, Dr. Sabia. Uh, we thank you for visiting our annual science exhibit, uh, Sinova. So, um, early on, sir, we were talking about um, passion. And the address you gave to our students today, our learners today, um, one theme that you kept speaking about was passion. Uh, tell me uh, a little bit about uh, your own journey into your pursuits and endeavors. So every, if you want me to connect this with passion, every individual is unique and one would have a unique source or impetus for passion. Uh, for me, it was probably my parents. So both of my parents, they were passionate about things around them. Uh, my father was a scientist. Uh, my mom, a social worker. Uh, we all believed in the potential of this country. Uh, so so that gave, gave rise to a strong sense of bonding with, with Pakistan. Uh, so even though we went abroad for studies and we decided to come back and with this passion, uh, we got into this profession, which is generally not considered to be very lucrative. That is of teaching and academics. So you need some impetus for passion. You might derive it from poetry. You might derive it from religion. You might derive it from cultural connections. There has to be something. And for every person, it's, it's different. It's, Sometimes you get it from great teachers. So this passion is, I think, generally transmitted from humans to yeah. hu other humans. It it comes out from a community. It, there's always a personal touch which inspires someone to do something. That's probably where I got it from. Uh, brilliant. So uh, coming, uh, I'll come to the role of the teacher definitely very soon. Uh, but prior to that, um, one of our key objectives is uh, focusing on early development and what better than to model uh, themselves after the best and uh, someone like yourself who's achieved so much. So what was that? Do you have that nostalgic experience of that one moment when you were young, exploring the world out there, exploring academia, that one moment where you told yourself this my mm. passion is going to be physics. Rest of it. My father was not just a scientist, he was yeah. a physicist. So I think I got it from uh, in heredity. Right. Okay. Uh, so I used to see my father sitting on a scanning electron microscope, which mm. is a device which lets you see the kind of nanoscopic world at a very small level. So he used to work on his electron microscope. After school, we used to visit him in his laboratory and see him surrounded by all these beautiful gadgets uh, and these extraordinary images that are coming out from materials which are otherwise not visible to the naked eye. So I think that was a moment of inspiration. And just and since he was a phys physicist and I had access to some of his best books, uh, I could see in, in those books the lure for physics. Physics by its very nature has this element of fascination in it. I think all of the those moments combined together, uh, they contributed to me becoming a physicist. But then I think a very important thing I should mention is that we got great teachers in school. And these were not just physics teachers. These, these were teacher, teachers of literature. 
of, of languages, Arabic, Urdu, even Persian. Uh, we were very lucky that in our school there was this atmosphere of literary learning. I think that coupled with physics, that right. literature coupled with physics, kind of rounded off the best individuals and they were they contributed to holistic development of myself if I'm developed at all <laughs> but I think this combination of literature and physics poetry and physics I think that really shaped what I am today brilliant sir then this brings me to exactly I mean um, my point uh, what are they your point about teachers um, you brought up one element which is of course parental influence which is so important in young learners but in that classroom physics has a beautiful story the, the the history of physics how it you know you can trace the roots back to ancient greece all the way to um uh Lebulonians. but there you go exactly how important do you think the role of the teacher the facilitator the mentor is in driving younger minds uh, to not just practice physics but to understand the meaning and the, the, the learn their story of this beautiful discipline. I think the role of the teacher is central. So over the past 10-15 years uh, education has been digitized. Mm -hmm. Education has been automated with all kinds of digital and cyber platforms. One would feel that the reach and penetration of education and holistic education would have gone up. But if you look at all the surveys conducted worldwide, is this big survey called the PISA survey, that has shown, concomitant with the upsurge in digital education, a decline in our level of understanding of numeracy and physics and mathematics, the PISA survey. So I think what the educationists of the time have forgotten is that education is not something to be automated and mechanized. It will always carry this human influence because that's the way how our brains have evolved over, over the millennia. Our brains and our neuroscience is shaped in a special way that it is affected by the human touch. It is affected by the human inspiration. We as humans are always inspired by other humans. And I think that's why the role of teacher is central. You look at all the great luminaries that we have today in science and technology. You ask them their stories. What was the spark that they received in their lives in their early education? It's always coming from a teacher. A teacher guides them to an experiment. A teacher guides them to an observation. A teacher guides them to a book. Uh, some personality from the leaves of history. It's always a teacher that is going to mold the trajectory, the neural traje trajectory of, of an early learner. But I think it's really central. And lucky are the ones who get the great, the greatest of all teachers. So, so I gather that uh, we need to find a balance between what we, is, what we were exposed to was cultural literacy, which maybe is mistakenly being rather than merging that with digital literacy, it appears that maybe digital literacy is now substituting cultural literacy. Do you think that's I, I fully agree with that. So digital literacy is, is something that's easier to achieve because it's mechanized, it's large scale, it's pervasive. It reaches every nook and corner just with the stroke of technology. Uh, though there are cultural barriers in the adoption of technology, Technology is so overwhelming that it just, everything succumbs to it. I think this cultural literacy is, is, is really important. And that comes through philosophy, through arts, through the history of science and history in general. Uh, I think it's very important to not to negate the role of culture, history, philosophy, sociology in how humans develop as learners. So, all the advances, uh, one can argue that physics is truly the queen of all sciences. Um, with all the advances it's making, it's with the James Webb, they're now breaking new boundaries. Um, 
sadly, it seems culturally we have regulated the role of sciences to a commodity, sort of a, what I call doctor economics here. Mm -hmm. Study physics, chemistry, biology and become a doctor, which is, of course, very important. But how do we, in our capacity, in our role, broaden the perspective of the sciences and stimulate the learners to explore other areas such as astrophysics or astrobiology? Our, it can only be achieved through the widening the scope of our education and having the best people who are open-minded, progressive, who have a large vistas of knowledge come as teachers at the level of schools because they are going to broaden the minds of students. So if a teacher uh, is parrots the same kind of idea that you have to become a doctor or an engineer or you have these lucrative professions and you need to only go into those professions, then the cause is lost. I think great teachers who widen the imagination and stoke the imagination of students at the level of schools is really important. And when it's also, we have to get out of the confines of curriculum. So our curricula at the secondary school level, they do not they have very little astronomy. They have very little of geology. They have very little of minerals. They have very little of uh, mathematical beauty concepts and mathematical beauty. So I think it's really important that we design a curriculum or we follow a curriculum that is more holistic, that is more embracive, that talks about connections because it's all really about connections. And the role of our educational system is not to teach a subject. It's to actually expose students to the variety of subjects and the variety of disciplines that exist and just open up the doors. You don't want them, the students to tread a particular discipline and master a particular discipline at the level of school. It's really important. The first priority should be to expose learners to the variety and the tapestry of disciplines that exist. Imagine a population of 250 million people or and every year there should be a hundred at least, if you can't even get a hundred physicists or a hundred astrophysicists just being added to the ecosystem, that's very poor planning. So that, And it all lies within our educational system and, and the people who are responsible for our educational kind of uplift. So, um, which again, of course, uh, is a problem that we face um, particularly, let's say, in the context of A-level students who often, dined, uh, often find this uh, reductive model quite suffocating. Um, uh, to give sort of a literature-based example, um, I, you know, there, I guess you can write mystery novels in two ways. One is your traditional whodunit, right, where that sort of exploratory journey to finding out, you know, who did this particular crime. Or the other way is where uh, the author would actually tell the audience, this is the, the individual who has committed the crime. But here's the journey as to, and the reader then is taken on this journey as to why it was committed, uh, uh, how it was done. And so, so it's, that story is unraveled. Now, in this sort of very reductive model, which is, here's, the content, and at the end of a certain duration of time, you have to write this exam. You just write what we tell you what you have to write, and you'll get a particular grade. That may be a reality, but how can we also simultaneously uh, supplement this with broader exploratory ideas that stimulate their curiosity? I think... Uh... Well, this reductionism uh, just also carries over to the universities, by the way. It's this kind of reductionism, not just in terms of taking the exam, but the epistemological reductionism of scientific knowledge and that we can reduce the big to the small and, and the small to the smaller carries over, to, by the way, to the entire scientific edifice, edifice in our country and around the world. But we have to break this if we really want to open up mind. So, and that epistemological creativity, if you remain inside the system, is very hard to achieve. We get students from C Cedar and other colleges who really who ace the A-level exam. 
but we find in them this kind of emptiness, this kind of shallowness that the substance is missing. We we have the outer shell, but the core has gone astray or it's totally amiss. So where is that core going to come from? That core is going to come from holistic, grounded education. So even if we are bounded and fettered by the regulations of A-levels, which by the way is a small veneer of the society, only 5% of children who reach grade 12 do A-levels in the country. It's a very small number. It's not a cross-section of the Pakistani society, by the way. We just need to keep that in mind. But if we're talking about those A-level students, they have to be exposed to other disciplines. And that can be achieved through, I think, Cedar College does this, core courses. These courses are voluntary initiatives taken by the teachers here and signed up by the students and probably have the backing of the parents as well. Uh, well, that's difficult to come, but... <laughs> Core courses is a great idea. A, a, a liberal arts flavor to whatever you teach in physics, chemistry, biology is also important because no one is going to control what you really teach in physics. If, for example, physics is taught in a historically appropriate way, in a synchronized fashion, the philosophy and physics go hand in hand. So if there's a philosophical bent inside the teaching of the regular physics course, that's also going to make a difference. And by the way, I've seen students inspired not by the mainstream teaching. They are all always inspired by the fringes. They always take cues from what the teacher, when the teacher steps out of his or her main proposition of doing physics and goes out into the boundaries and looks at syntheses of physics with other areas. So even the courses, the regular reductive courses that are being taught at the A level, they could be interspersed and and livened with in with, with holistic ideas. So one is enlivening regular teaching of the, the sciences with holistic ideas. Second are these core courses. Third are study circles, book reviews, the kind of science fairs that you organize. All of these go hand in hand and have a space, physical space inside the college. All colleges should have this where students can just come in and they can build things, they can create things. They We need common rooms where science uh, and technology could be done in, in interesting ways. And sometimes you need to escape the regulators. You need to escape the curriculum. This escape is, is good for the mind and it's good for the societal health as well. So be bold, be adventurous. There's no one stopping you from being adventurous. And I think in, in the process, our students will get transformed. They're never transformed by the exam. They're never transformed by the GPA or the grades that they get. They're transformed by those moments of ecstasy that are interspersed within the regular class. Um, I have to ask you this. Uh, the elephant in the room. The role of artificial intelligence. Uh, first and foremost, are you viewing this as a progressive development or with slight levels of skepticism? Like all technologies, uh, <clears throat> everything comes with some level of skepticism. But I'm not really a philosophical skeptic on on artificial intelligence. The artificial intelligence is really here to stay. It's uh, how, If you look at how technology evolves, starting from thousands of years ago, this was the next natural step in the development of technology. We've seen similar movements in biology, for example. In biology, starting from the central dogma of biology from the 1920s and 30s, which built upon more, uh, Mendel's genetics, biology transformed to the scale of, of discovering synthetic biology, in which artificial life could be built, artificial life forms could be engineered, and biology was kind of replaced by this kind of synthetic engineering perspective. Now biology is very engineering-oriented. So the similar ideas have developed in information technology, starting from the transmission of radio signals to the mathematization of information to the development of computers to, to the building of algorithms to the entire blossoming of the field of computer science. Artificial intelligence was the next natural logical step. So it isn't accidental. It's 
very much a part of the kind of evolution of the discipline of computing and thinking and logic from the time of the Greeks. This is the new logic. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, they are the new logic. So they have replaced kind of Hellenistic ideas about philosophy and rhetoric and logic. They are the new logic. I think they're here to stay and we need to embrace them. We need to benefit from them. We, our educational curricula, have to tune themselves so that they become not only aware of this idea, but they can also harness artificial intelligence. Of course, it's going to have its repercussions. It's going to decide how we do our assessments. But that's a good thing, by the way. That's a blessing in disguise. We need to let away with the kind of assessments that we already do. So it's more about a new framework, a new psychology, by the way, has to catch up with it. The philosophy of learning the psychobiology of learning has to catch up with artificial intelligence. Now the task is upon the psychologists of learning to come up to pace with the rapid advances in AI and to see, really see how the brain works. Our last final frontier that I see in, in science and tech is the human mind, consciousness. Our consciousness is a product of biology thousands of years of evolution in the human species, how we think. But we really haven't understood consciousness and how we think. We know more about the moon than we know about the brain that's inside each one of us. So the neuropsychology of learning has to adapt itself and rediscover itself in light of artificial intelligence. So I think the onus is now upon the psychologists. Welcome to <laughs> yeah. the area. Uh, it's upon them to see how the human mind works, how the learning process unfolds in the human mind and how can it respond to artificial intelligence. The biggest uh, victim of our educational system as it exists now, thanks to AI, would be the kind of exams we take, the kind of homeworks that we give out to our students. Now we have to be really creative in learning and but there are certain areas which will are so far untouched and those have to deal with passion those have to deal with literary styles the, those have to deal with with the passion that effuses when you read literature AI still cannot you know do that with per perfection if you look at an AI generated text of say a literary synthetic literary works, still it falls short of that human element. So what is it that makes us human? <laughs> so AI is, I think, a great challenge upon us and we have to embrace it first and we have to attune our educational systems in, in response to that. Uh, and I think in a very, uh, sort of, I think the beauty of this profession is it uh, allows us to be lifelong learners. So do you think uh, this puts a very progressive um, pressure on uh, teachers and I believe parents to continue their little learning journey and adapt themselves to the uh, to this coming trend of uh, because I think that balance will help us uh, uh, reach that merger between digital and cultural literacy. So do you think there's a certain pressure on teachers and, and parents now to engage in the process of learning about uh, AI? and I fully concur with yeah. you. I mean, AI is a challenge upon us. AI has given us this opportunity to rethink what we take of education. And it's it's going to be really a lifelong process. It's You cannot sit docile in and, and comfortable cozy chairs and just Imagine that you've done and everything and you just need to regurgitate what you do every day in the classroom every day. It has to be a response. There has to be a response and an adaptive uh, process in which we embrace AI. So it's going to be lifelong. It's going to stay with time. And it really rattles our beliefs uh, in, in, in being steady. It, it shakes our beliefs about education, about learning. It's good to be unsettled. An educationist has to be unsettled and always on the move. So I think the teachers really must need 
they need to change themselves. They have to change themselves every day. And that's why this profession is beautiful. It remains creative. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Sabia. It's been a wonderful uh, experience talking with you and uh, accessing your thoughts and uh, views on this. Um, we wish you all the best in the future. Thanks for tuning in to Listen Up and we'll see you in our next episode.